FPCI Ambassadorial Lecture in cooperation with the Canadian Embassy in Jakarta. FPCI is proud to host this series in which today we have here with us His Excellency Ambassador Cameron McKay, Ambassador of Canada to Indonesia. Welcome, Ambassador. Today, we are also joined by students and lecturers from Universitas Hasanuddin Makassar. Thank you to the International Relations Department of Universitas Hasanuddin and our FPCI chapter at UNHAS. It's not every day university students can get the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the ambassador. So I'm certain that today's discussion will be very enlightening and useful for us all. My name is Cindy and I will be the moderator for today's event. Uh, you know, if we weren't in the midst of this pandemic, this would usually be in the format of a tea time discussion. So I have here with me my hot cup of tea. And if you have yours, let's enjoy this virtual tea time discussion together. Ladies and gentlemen, today we aim to be able to provide more understanding on the present and future relationship between Canada and Indonesia. And we will cover various issues relating to the COVID-19 pandemic that is now infecting both countries, as well as multilateralism and free trade agreements, among other things. I would like to remind you that at the end of this discussion, the Canadian Embassy has prepared a fun quiz for us. So make sure to follow and check out the Embassy's Instagram page at Canada and Indonesia, as they have left a clue for the quiz later on. Also, don't forget to share your moments with us from this event by tagging at FPC Indo and at Canada and in Indonesia on your social media posts. Now, before we begin, I would like to invite the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Patijalal, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Silakan, Pak Dino. Okay, thank you, uh, Cindy. Uh, I don't have tea with me, but I do have my yogurt, right? And it's not a commercial, by the way. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Cameron McKay for uh, joining us and actually uh, uh, for, for initiating this uh, event. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, event uh, collaborated between Canadian Embassy and uh, FPCI uh, where the Canadian Ambassador would have a meet and greet and have a frank and fun uh, discussions uh, on, on any issues. Uh, that are of interest to the, the students. Uh, I want to say hi to uh, pa, uh, Muhammad Asri, who is my good friend, a lecturer at Universitas Hasanuddin, and who once joined a track one and a half uh, dialogue with uh, the United States uh, in Washington, D.C., where he performed uh, very well to present Indonesia's positions. Uh, I want to just say something about Canada. Uh, a lot of people associate me with the United States of America because I studied there uh, for high school and I was ambassador in Washington, D.C. Right? So whenever they have an uh, issue about Trump elections and so on, and they always call me. But many people don't know that uh, I actually have a lot of Canada uh, in me. So after I was uh, in New York uh, studying, I moved to Canada, to Ottawa, uh, Carleton University, and then uh, I got my bachelor's degree there and I moved to Vancouver where it was a lot warmer and stayed uh, and, and studied at uh, Simon Fraser University. And uh, I can tell you that uh, Canada, Canada is very special uh, to me. I still have a lot of friends there. And what I noticed uh, in particular was uh, when I was in New York, uh, for some reason it was still there was still some racial thing going on at that time, yeah? Uh, in the sense that uh, there were only Italians in Italian neighborhoods, there were only Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rican neighborhoods, uh, and Jewish people in Jewish neighborhoods, Blacks in their own neighborhoods. There, there was not many places where they all mixed together, right? Uh, and in the school that I went to, you could feel it. Uh, the, the, there were racial interactions, but, but not like uh, where it needed to be. And then I moved to Canada and, and I really did not feel any of that. Like C Canada was much more aggressive, sorry, progressive uh, on those issues of uh, pluralism, multiculturalism than uh, the United States at that time. I'm talking about the, the early 80s. Yeah. So, so I really had a lot of, uh, you know, fun, fun uh, memories in Canada. C Canadians are very open people. Uh, they hate to be called Americans because they have the same accent, uh, basically, as uh, the, the Americans. But, uh, you know, whenever they travel to Europe, they always say, hey, we're Canadians, right? We're not Americans. Right? Uh, and they're very proud. Uh, and their foreign policy machinery is, is excellent. They have the best diplomats. Uh, 
I've worked with so many of them. And even now, Indonesia and Canada are working uh, multilaterally uh, on COVID-19 issues uh, and, and so on and so on. Um, so that's all I need to say. Uh, Canada is uh, has a special place in my heart. I would encourage uh, uh, all of you to uh, find out more about Canada uh, and maybe even study there uh, once you graduate from Universitas Hasanuddin. And I, I promise you, you will have the same experience that I did. You know, it's a wonderful place to study. High educational standards, uh, much cheaper uh, than most other Western uh, uh, nations. Uh, good food, uh, welcoming people. Uh, the weather, you know, you know, we'll see. I, I wasn't too crazy about the cold weather, but but I, I cope with it. So with that, uh, please listen and have a good conversation with Ambassador uh, Cameron. And I'm gonna leave uh, because I don't want uh, to be seen as a big brother watching this uh, discussions. So thank you, uh, Ambassador, and back to you, Cindy. Okay, thank you, Padino. And, thank you, Padino. Uh, yes. Good to see you again, Padino. Thank you, thank everybody. You, Padino. Thank you, thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, thank you. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us now begin today's discussion. So may I invite His Excellency Ambassador Cameron McKay. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Terima Kasi and Salamat Siang. Uh, and thanks to Pak Dino um, and FPCI for pulling this event together today. I'm really uh, delighted and excited to spend some time with you all. Uh, I do want to come back at the end of this, absolutely, and open it up to questions. And I would encourage you to ask me about anything at all that you're curious about, um, about Canada or anything else to do with Canada, Canadian policy life there. Um, but first, uh, I'd like, before getting into explaining um, some aspects of Canadian foreign policy and how we see the world at the moment, I'd like you to try to imagine yourself as a Canadian. I think as a diplomat, one of the key ways to try to understand the rest of the world is to really try to see the world through, through someone else's eyes. Um, and so it's in that light, I want you to try this little exercise with me. Um, to imagine you're Canadian. Like Indonesia, Canada is extremely diverse. Pactino spoke about that. With respect to both geography, um, it's the second largest country uh, in the world. Um, and it's, it's very geographically diverse from north to south and east to west, like Indonesia. And its people are particularly diverse. So as a Canadian, that's who you are right now, you might have grown up uh, as a child on a vast open prairie with blue skies and golden fields of wheat uh, and cattle ranches uh, on a farm. Or as a Canadian, you might have grown up in a temperate rainforest, a rainforest like Indonesia's, but a cooler one, uh, for example, on the west coast of, uh, of Canada, where I grew up, um, on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And when you went to the beach and you looked out on the beach, you saw Asia off in the distance. Um, or you might have grown up in a small wooden house that your ancestors built in a small village uh, in Atlantic Canada on the Atlantic Ocean. And as you look out to sea, you know that on the other side is Europe, is France and Britain. But if you're a Canadian, it's most likely that you come from a city, probably a very modern city, probably a city of well over a million people. Um, as a Canadian, whether your family is high income or low income, you almost certainly received a world-class education at a public school, that is to say a government-funded school, um, at the elementary level or at the secondary level. You probably did not go to private schools. They're not so common in Canada. And now, as a university student, you're studying at an excellent public university. Again, government funded. We have no private universities in Canada. Um, the tuition you pay is very low, as Pak Dino said, uh, compared to a developed country like the United States. And if you still cannot afford to pay that tuition, the government will loan you money uh, that you have to pay back later so to ensure that you have the opportunity to get an excellent post-secondary education. Money should not prevent talented people uh, from going to university. That's the Canadian view. And by the way, as a Canadian university student or anyone in Canada, if you get ill, you will go to a public hospital and the government will pay the bill. 
Whether you are rich or whether you are poor, you will go to the same hospital. It will be a very good hospital. And when you walk out of the hospital, you will not uh, pay for that. You do pay through your taxes, uh, but frankly, we're all in it together and help each other uh, through healthcare issues and education that way. Um, again, as a Canadian, it's possible that your ancestors were Aboriginal North Americans. Uh, that's about one or 2% of the Canadian population now, but it's much, much more likely that your ancestors were immigrants. Almost all uh, Canadians uh, are descended from immigrants, probably from Europe or from Asia. If you're from the city of Toronto, Canada's largest city, you speak English at school and at work and on the street. But there's a 50% chance, if you're from Toronto, that you are an immigrant, that you were born in another country. Um, and therefore at home with your family, you probably do not speak English. You probably speak one of more than 100 languages that are spoken in Toronto. It's one of the world's most multicultural cities. Um, your parents probably sent you to language school on Saturdays. You were going to school in English. They wanted to make sure that you understood their language and the, ancestor, and the language of their ancestors. So they would have sent you to Saturday language school to learn how to speak good Greek or Ukrainian or Mandarin or Bahasa. Um, the same would be true, by the way, if you were from a city like Vancouver. That's where I'm from. Uh, Canada's most Asian city on the Pacific coast um, where more than 70 languages are spoken and about 50% of the residents of Vancouver do not speak English in their homes. They speak some other language, um, most likely uh, an Asian language uh, from Hindi to Urdu to Mandarin to Vietnamese. Um, and of course, if you are a Canadian from Montreal in the province of Quebec, Montreal being the second largest French speaking city in the world after Paris, you almost certainly speak French at home and on the street. Plus when you need to, you speak excellent English. That's a typical Montrealer. Um, and as a Montrealer, you almost certainly dress more fashionably than uh, the English speaking classmates in your classroom. Uh, Quebecers and Montrealers are famous for that too. I say all of this because for most non-Canadians, it's actually very difficult to imagine just how incredibly multicultural Canada is and how that affects our worldview and how government officials and diplomats um, think about the rest of the world. Um, because we're so multicultural, we know that for everyone within Canada and outside of Canada to get along uh, and to prosper, um, we have to have tolerance built into our DNA. We have to accept everyone as they are and not hate other people and not try to change them just because they think differently than we do. Which is not to say that all Canadians are more tolerant. Um, in fact, Canada too, like every country in the world, has bigots. We have racists. We have misogynists who think that men are here and women are here. Um, and we have religious fundamentalists, of course. Um, but they're a very small minority. The great majority of Canadians have no tolerance for those who hate uh, based on the color of someone's skin or their gender or their beliefs about religion or who they choose to love and to marry. So with that, I'd like you to imagine that you come from that background, one of those places, you're a Canadian and you've grown up this way and now you work as a policymaker or a diplomat. And to be a diplomat in particular, I think, which is about relationships between countries, the first countries we need to look at are our neighbors. So who are Canada's neighbors and how does that shape our foreign policy? Well, if you look immediately to the north and just over the North Pole, our neighbors are the Russians, formerly the Soviet Union. Uh, we did not get along very well with them in the past, and there are still some tensions with Russia. Um, to the west, across the Pacific Ocean, is Asia. Uh, China, Japan, and Korea are the closest to us. They're directly across 
uh, the Pacific from us, and then further south, countries like Thailand and of course, Indonesia. And if you are a Canadian, you may not know very much about Indonesia, but what you do know is that it's warm, the most beautiful country on the planet and a tropical paradise. That's about what Canadians know about Indonesia. Um, to the east, as a policymaker, now you're looking east, what do you see? Across the Atlantic, Europe. Over the last hundred years, the host of the two greatest wars of the last century, um, but now home to the European Union, an economic powerhouse, and frankly, a force for, uh, for democracy and prosperity, I believe. And then as a Canadian, look south. Your first immediate neighbor south, with whom you share the world's largest and longest undefended border. Uh, and we're speaking now, of course, about the United States of America, uh, the country with whom we share uh, a continent. Um, as a Canadian, you know that 200 years ago, uh, Canadians fought a war with that country, uh, the War of 1812, which actually lasted several years. And at that time, it was uh, Canadians, and we were then mostly British, um, were the only country to successfully invade the United States of America and burn the White House to the ground. Uh, so a little fun, fun fact about Canadian history. But that was more than 200 years ago, and um, we've come a long way since then. Since then, of course, Canada and the United States have both um, left uh, those conflicts far behind. War makes no sense, um, uh, and frankly, makes us all worse off and poorer. So instead, we've gone exactly the opposite direction. Canada and the United States have the world's two most highly integrated economies through the North American Free Trade Agreement and many hundreds of other bilateral treaties with the United States. We now say that we don't just trade with each other, we make things together. Uh, and that ranges from cars and aircraft to software and food. Um, the border goods and services travel across the border uh, about 2 billion US dollars a day. Uh, it's the world's largest trading relationship. Um, so we have replaced these conflicts of centuries ago uh, with trade, which has led us to both be very, very prosperous countries, I think. Um, uh, nevertheless, as a, as a Canadian policymaker, you look around and who are our neighbors? Again, uh, across uh, the, the um, Pacific Ocean, we have the world's fastest growing emergent power, uh, China. Um, you look uh, down to the south, we have the world's greatest superpower, the United States. And then to the north and to the west, we have ancient superpowers, Russia and Europe, who still aspire to global greatness. So that is the neighborhood that we grew up in. That's how, who we first see when we look abroad and before we go further abroad and look at um, important G20 countries like Indonesia. So let me summarize again. As a Canadian, you come from an incredibly diverse and tolerant country where the government really strives uh, with everyone's taxpayer dollars to ensure equality of opportunity, which is a key principle in Canada, whether you're rich or poor, you should have access to healthcare, you should have access to a great education. If we have that as a starting point, then you can live the Canadian dream. Um, your country also has serious problems, of course, like all countries do. And I mentioned some earlier, we of course have racism and bigotry and environmental problems and the list goes on. But as a diplomat, when you work abroad and look to what is it that we should be doing abroad um, to basically advance our interests and, and values, uh, we know that my country, Canada, and other countries and citizens around the world will be best off in a world that is peaceful, that is tolerant, where individuals are free to think and say anything they want, uh, and that to do business and to trade freely uh, will lead to our prosperity. And finally, and this is very important, um, that we should all be protected by the rule of law, not rule by law, but the rule of law. And it should apply equally to everyone, rich, poor, powerful, weak, Rule of law is rule of law. This should apply at home in my country, Canada, and it should apply internationally. 
for a country like Canada, a world of might makes right, where the rich and the powerful can get what they want, regardless of whether it's fair or regardless of the impact on the poorest and the weakest, is not a world uh, that reflects Canadian interests or Canadian values. So now I'd like to come to the last part of my, my little exercise. Now I'd like you to imagine that you're the ambassador of Canada in a powerful G20 country like Indonesia. And you're, you are in that role at a time of the greatest pandemic, health pandemic that the planet has seen in a hundred years. Um, so let me speak a little bit now, frankly, about how I uh, see things. And um, let me say, I grew up in the West Coast of Canada, Vancouver. My father was a police officer. My mother was a nurse. And now I'm an ambassador. This is a very Canadian story. So how do I see things now? Well, clearly, COVID is not just a public health uh, crisis. Um, the need for physical distancing to control the spread of the virus has triggered a global economic crisis, which in turn is affecting both domestic politics in all of our countries and the global diplomatic scene. Uh, so as I see it, many of the political and diplomatic pressures and trends that we saw before the crisis have now been accelerated. I'll list a few now. The great power rivalry between the world's two most powerful countries uh, has intensified. Um, many countries around the world in the light of COVID are witnessing an increase in nationalism and xenophobia. They're afraid of their neighbors and they're trying to push people away. Authoritarian governments around the world, not democracies, are not letting a good crisis go to waste. Go to waste. Some are using the crisis to their advantage to securitize their response and to strengthen the control they have over their populations. In many countries, there's increased concern about personal privacy uh, and technological surveillance, uh, which is being exacerbated by the use of tracking apps in our phones that are used and sometimes imposed uh, by states. Coupled with this are intensified concerns about bad actors uh, leveraging our increased dependence on uh, digital technology, including to influence public opinion through misinformation campaigns. Uh, so cybersecurity has never been more important than it is now. And unfortunately, especially in the first few weeks of this crisis, uh, many countries initially responded with a kind of a, a, me, a me first attitude. I have to take care of myself. I don't care about my neighbors anymore. This was coupled with blatant protectionism um, that further undermined the credibility of the multilateral system that we have all been building in the decades since uh, we first launched these projects uh, after the Second World War. And I'm speaking now about the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, um, and the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, et cetera. So this is the world as I see it now as a Canadian ambassador. And for Canada, and I believe for Indonesia as well, and other so-called middle powers, we're not great powers, but we're middle powers. These are frightening developments. Um, our countries, as I said before, will simply not prosper in, uh, in a world of the law of the jungle um, and might makes right. So we and other countries are instead committed to improving and adapting uh, the so-called rules-based international order, basically international law and the rules that we've all been negotiating for decades. The purpose of this is to ensure that we all benefit from the protection of international rule of law. Um, let me speak a little bit about the Canada-Indonesia relationship now. Before the crisis, Canada and Indonesia had roughly balanced uh, trade in goods and services, about $4 billion a year of uh, trade back and forth. Canadian direct investment into Indonesia, um, companies basically investing in the Indonesian economy was about $3.2 billion. Um, and Indonesia was our second largest investment destination after Singapore here in the ASEAN region. Um, Indonesians in turn had invested about $84 million in Canada. Uh, over 2000 young Indonesians were studying in Canada the beginning of the crisis, and Canada welcomed roughly 27,000 Indonesian tourists every year. 
And conversely, about 100,000 Canadian tourists visited Indonesia every year because it's the tropical paradise I described before. And clearly that's all changed uh, thanks to COVID. Um, less so with respect to trade in goods. Trade in goods is still flowing, um, but especially some service sectors air transportation, uh, tourism, anything that depends on travel, of course, has been um, uh, completely decimated. It, it, it's almost, it's currently practically non-existent. So we need to work hard now to limit the damage and lay the groundwork for a solid uh, recovery in the long term. Um, as a diplomat, I know that no country can achieve this on its own, no matter, even the greatest of the great powers, simply cannot get out of this alone. We have to work together. So for Canada's part, we're working hard with countries like Indonesia uh, in particular in multilateral institutions and in groupings like the G20, the 20 largest economies uh, in the world were both members, um, APEC, uh, and of course the World Trade Organization, uh, which is important to us both um, to help us move forward in a more um, sustainable and resilient uh, way toward economic recovery. Um, so when it comes to multilateral institutions that are under unprecedented pressure now and criticism, uh, rather than throw them out or leave them, we believe that we need to invest in them um, and make them better uh, and make them stronger. Um, within the G20, for example, Canada and Indonesia are working together to commit ourselves to preserve the flow of vital uh, medical supplies, critical agricultural products for food and other essential goods and services. Um, the Canadian Foreign Minister Champagne has created a new grouping, the Multilateral Coordination Group on COVID-19, it's called. Um, Indonesian Foreign Minister uh, Retno Marsudi is, is a member. The group focuses through conference calls every two or three weeks on the cross-border movement of goods and services and people. And Indonesia in particular has been leading the discussion on um, the role of the private sector and how to ensure that global supply chains continue to flow so we can get medicine and food and everything else um, that we need across borders. Looking ahead to the post-pandemic future, Canada is also taking a leading role in the World Trade Organization through something we call the Ottawa Group, uh, which is a small group of countries that's working to renew that organization to make sure that global trade continues to follow rules and not simply might makes right. Maybe let me conclude now by saying one of our top foreign policy priorities, especially today, uh, is the United Nations, um, and in particular, the UN Security Council. So in fact, it is today in New York. Uh, we're 11 hours ahead of New York, so it'll be tonight in Jakarta, morning in New York. There will be the first ballot vote for the next uh, members of the Western Europe and others group. Um, to sit on the UN Security Council. I think you know that the UN Security Council is 15 countries, five permanent members, uh, and 10 elected members. Canada has not been on the UN Security Council for 20 years, um, and we're making a bid that it should be uh, our turn. Our competitors, frankly, are excellent and are also very strong on diplomacy and share almost all of Canada's interests and values. Um, Ireland and Norway. The three of us are competing for two seats. So one of us will, uh, will not succeed. Um, frankly, Canada thinks that, of course, we, we uh, deserve a seat there. We have the largest uh, diplomatic network of those two countries. Um, and frankly, one of the things that Canada is quite proud of is we're not afraid to say no. Uh, we have never been afraid to say no to the United States. Uh, who would have liked us to join the Vietnam War or the Iraq War, and we said no. We say no to Europe, we say no to China. When they're wrong, we uh, are free to disagree um, and unafraid to do so. Um, and I think that that makes Canada's bid um, and our seat on the Security Council uh, particularly important. But we should wake up in the morning and know if we have won or not. And if not, congratulations to, uh, to Ireland and Norway. Um, but we have had a global campaign now uh, for more than a year. And the top priorities, of course, now that you're Canadian diplomats, you understand these instinctively, five priorities. The first is sustain peace together. The second is address climate change together. The third, promote 
economic prosperity for everyone together. Uh, and fifth, uh, sorry, fourth, advance gender equality together, the equality of men and women. And finally, strengthen multilateralism together. Uh, those are our campaign uh, themes. Uh, that's what we will strive to achieve if we win uh, this vote. Um, and if not, we will, of course, continue to strive to achieve uh, those things through the United Nations and through all of the other multilateral uh, fora um, in which Canada is a member, including the G7, G20, the uh, Commonwealth countries, Francophonie. Um, this is where Canada is coming from. And, and now that you are thinking like Canadian diplomats, you understand exactly why it is that we see things, uh, we see things that way. Um, with that as a bit of an introductory uh, exercise, I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions again on, uh, on any topic. I know I've been speaking for a long time and speaking quickly, so also if there was anything I said uh, that, you, um, that you'd like me to explain uh, more deeply or to repeat, I, I'm happy to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, so now let's dive into the question and answer session. Uh, I'll be starting with the first batch of questions and I will be taking three questions per batch, which will then be answered by Ambassador McKay before moving on to the next batch. So to ask your question, uh, you can use the raise hand feature on your Zoom app by clicking participants and then selecting the raise hand option on the bottom right. And I will be randomly selecting from those who have raised their hands. So, Okay, uh, I see here Anissa Apriliani. Uh, I'll give the floor over to you. Please state your name and your question, but do limit it to one question per person. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, FPJ Indonesia, for this opportunity of ambassadorial lecture or tea time, if you might prefer. Um, allow me to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Anissa Apriliani. I'm a second student. Uh, I'm a second year student of international relations in Universitas Sasanudin. And today here with my friends um, and my fellows from uh, international relations, uh, there are several of us who are from the FPCA chapter UNHAS in which we are um, trying to revive the FPCA in chapter UNHAS after a very long time of um, um, inactivity. Um, I'm, I'm, today I'm here as the president of FPCA chapter UNHAS, but of course um, there will be a further talk with me and. Um, FHA Indonesia for the further um, mechanism. Now, um, Ambassador, um, when you when you told us to reflect ourselves as um, to practice uh, ourselves being in the being in the um, mindset of a Canadian, I reflected back to my experience when I was um, in my exchange program. I did study in in the United States, uh, more specifically in Buffalo. So. I did experience a significant influence of Canada in our culture. Uh, for example, uh, we bought Starbucks instead of Tim Hortons in our community. And even uh, even for my host family and my friends, uh, there's this notion that uh, the, the Canadian side of the Niagara Falls is even better as opposed to the American side, in which there is something that I personally wanted to see, but never um, have the opportunity to do so. Okay, so yeah, that's the uh, introduction. Now, onto the question. Um, I believe it is globally known that uh, one of the Canadian values which are reflected towards the foreign policy is indeed multilateralism and uh, pluralism. Uh, you have explained to us on how um, Canada is one of the countries that is one of the countries that promote um, diversity because it is indeed uh, very um, geographically diverse to begin with. And you have also mentioned the five priorities that you want uh, that Canada wants to fight for in uh, the Security Council. Now, um, along from these five uh, priority topics, um, I, I would like to highlight more on the uh, multilateralism strengthening. Now, um, what are specifically the um, what are what what are the specific um, actions or like um, programs that Canada wants to uh, fight under this? Uh, under this topic, because uh, as you have mentioned before, even even with this even with this uh, condition that we are uh, we are now globally um, uh, tackling with the the, pan the, the pandemic, uh, some of the countries are very are very reluctant to help each other. And um, although there is indeed a hope 
for a global global cooperation. Um, it is unfortunate to see that more countries pre, uh, prefer to prioritize them, them themselves first. Now, um, as Canada and as a, as a country which fight for multilateralism, how how would you how would you see how would you project uh, Canada to to put put its role between this, um, for example, the P5 countries, which which have a very strong st stance in nowadays foreign policy. Um, yeah, so that that is the question. I hope you, uh, I hope my point get across. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to give my floor back to Mbak Cindy. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for your question. Now, taking the second question, we have Fadil Pramadiansyah. Please state your name and your question. All right, thank you for your uh, opportunity. So uh, good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to meet you, even though it's a virtual meeting. And many, it's a bunch of thanks to FPCI to have conducted this, um, uh, this a lovely meeting with us, with uh, UNHAS. So um, maybe my question would, uh, it's a little bit out of context, but uh, hopefully you can you cannot you can answer it. Um, as we know that Canada has the longest coastline in the world, and Indonesia it's in rank rank, um, rank third, and yet Indonesia is an archi archipelagic state that um, has uh, many of maritime issues. Um, I would like to have your uh, opinion or, suge or suggestion. Uh, what is your what is your suggestion to Indonesian government? As we know, uh, Canada has uh, its uh, has its the longest uh, coastline in, in the world. And what is your what is, what is Canada report? And what is, what is your uh, opinion to Indonesian government um, to I mean to, uh, to handle? Uh, this kind of maritime issues. Uh, maybe that's all. Thank you for the for the occasion. Thank you, Fadil. And for the last question, we'll take Adis De Mafira. Please state your name and your question. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador and everyone here. Uh, I would like to thank um, FPCI. Um, for this opportunity, and also Emb Embassy of Canada in Jakarta. Uh, and I will go straight to my question. Uh, how do Canada sustain its plurality spirit, as Mr. Ambassador already mentioned before, and especially can overcome nationalism movement that might be already happen uh, from one of the community in the country all along the way until now in 2020? Uh, maybe that's all from me, and thank you, Cindy. Thank you. So now I'll hand over the floor back to Ambassador Karen McKay. Great. Thanks very much for that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take the questions in a slightly different order, but I'll, I'll try to cover them all. Um, on pluralism versus nationalism and trying to ensure that communities all get along. Um, the Canadian, I, well, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a position to provide advice to the Indonesian government. I think <clears throat> that's a question, of course, for Indonesians to decide, but I can tell a story about how it is that we became who we are in Canada. And the truth is, um, one thing I didn't mention in describing, I alluded to it, but it wasn't very clear about English and French in Canada. I mean, Canada really had three founding nations. Uh, the Aboriginal North Americans were there first. And then the French came. Uh, and when the French came, they also, uh, first they traded with, but they also partly conquered uh, the, uh, the Aboriginal people. And then the English came and they conquered the French and the Aboriginal people eventually. There's a lot more detail to that to Canadian history, but the truth is, in, in particular because of the English and the French, the English came to dominate the country. They uh, did not have the numbers to completely overwhelm the French, frankly. They, they needed to leave the French in their community. Laws that are now reflected in the Canadian constitution, protecting the French culture, protecting the French language, protecting the Catholic religion. The English were Protestant, the French were Catholic. So from the beginning of Canada being a modern nation state, we were founded on compromise and founded on tolerance 
between these two peoples who had come from countries in Europe that were constantly at war. So from the very beginning, we had this notion of we must cooperate to get along. Now, it hasn't been perfect. There have been many, many conflicts since then between English and French, and there's a whole, you could write a PhD thesis on these things. But, but largely speaking, Canadian, uh, English speaking Canadians and French speaking Canadians have lived peacefully now for 150 years with some disagreements here and there. Um, I think one other thing about Canada that sort of forces us to think collectively is we live in a very, Pac Dino mentioned, very cold country. And in the winter, the environment is incredibly hostile. Um, and we learned early on, the Europeans learned from Aboriginal North Americans and then started learning with each other that if we do not cooperate in the winter, we will not survive. So it was a survival strategy for us to tolerate other people, to cooperate, to learn that we're, we, we cannot do this alone. So that be, started to become very instinctive uh, for Canadians. And frankly, I think that's true in every country around the world. Wherever you see intolerance, nationalism, favoritism to one group over another, you can sustain that for a period of time. Uh, the colonial era was an example of that, but it's not a good way for people to live over the long run. Um, and I think if people are educated the right way, uh, to have a wider view of the world, they will come to understand that instinctively and realize that intolerance, nationalism, fear of other people, looking inward, these are all strategies to make us uh, poor and fearful. And no one wants that. Um, about the coastline, so uh, it, it is indeed, you've done your geography, Canada has the world's largest or uh, longest coastline very similar to Indonesia's actually. And if you look to the north of Canada, there's a, basically a string of islands that go from the mainland up uh, to the frozen uh, North Pole. Um, so we too are challenged at times like Indonesia um, with maintaining our sovereignty. We have a huge territory to manage um, and only 38 million taxpayers to help to pay for the equipment that's needed uh, you know, to manage all of this. So once again, we've learned we simply cannot um, do this alone. We have to have rules and we have to have cooperation in order to manage all of this territory and all the coastline that we're responsible for. Um, and I'll give you one couple of concrete examples. Canada actually has five boundary disputes where we bitterly disagree uh, with another neighbor about whether that rock or that island or this coastline does the border go in this direction or this direction. And these are meaningful disputes. Um, in at least two of them, there's very significant oil and gas reserves under the water. And the decision about the maritime uh, boundary is frankly, therefore, consequential. Um, and the neighbor with whom we have that dispute is the United States of America. Uh, again, the world's most powerful uh, country. And so the Canadian strategy, of course, to deal with this is not conflict, it's rules. Uh, and so UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Canada was very active in negotiating that treaty, and we're very assertive uh, in protecting our rights under that treaty, and we have high expectations that others, even the United States, has not fully implemented uh, the treaty, but they did negotiate it and they largely abide by it. And we prefer internationally to use rules and courts uh, to protect our sovereignty and manage our coastline. Um, I should say we also have a boundary dispute with Denmark uh, over Hans Island, Denmark being a, a country of the European Union. So we have our own boundary disputes and it's rules and cooperation and dialogue that gets us through that. Indonesia, of course, has its own um, issues in the South China Sea, where there is one very large country, a very dominant player, and several other smaller players. And it's easy to see in any situation of game theory that the only way those smaller players will ever be able to defend their interests is if they do so collectively uh, through the, the principle of, um, of uh, collective diplomacy. Um, uh, and finally, just about uh, multilateralism and, the, and sort of uh, UN Security Council and our um, priorities. Um, I, I enumerated the five priorities, of course, sustaining peace together for Canada is very much about peacekeeping. We're still a very significant peacekeeping nation. We like to think that we invented United Nations peacekeeping following the uh, Suez crisis. Our foreign minister of the day won a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, 
for establishing the first UN peacekeeping force. So we're very keen on, um, on ensuring that the UN retains the ability uh, to act uh, with respect to peacekeeping. I know Indonesia shares that. Now, climate change, Canada is very um, uh, dedicated to the Paris uh, commitments that we have made. That'll be a real challenge for us domestically. We have a large oil and gas industry ourselves. Um, and, uh, and we have a large and cold economy. Um, so we will struggle at home to meet our domestic commitments on climate change, but we're committed to doing so. And we're committed to helping other countries do so, again, through international uh, cooperation and, uh, for example, development assistance, where Canada is also a significant player. Promoting economic security together, that has a lot to do with um, food security and, frankly, economic growth, market-driven economic growth that is inclusive. So Canada's all about inclusive economic growth. We will not prosper collectively if a small group of people become very rich and everyone else is left behind. We all need to benefit from, uh, from markets and from economic growth. Um, advancing gender equality, again, it's just core to our DNA and our uh, prime minister has been extremely clear since he was first elected, Justin Trudeau in 2015, when he established a Canadian cabinet, his ministers are 50-50, men and women, Canadian ambassadors abroad, 50-50, men and women, Canadian vice ministers in the federal government, we call them deputy ministers, 50-50, men and women. Um, uh, you know, the Chinese say women hold up half the sky um, and men struggle with the, with the other half. Um, we, we were absolutely dedicated to gender equality. Uh, as a matter of fairness um, and as a foundation for prosperity. Um, and finally, strengthening multilateralism. Again, Canada is a member of almost every international club you can think of. Uh, and uh, we have a large diplomatic footprint. We have more than 180 diplomatic offices around the world. Um, and so we are very uh, tightly coordinated between our multilateral policy and our bilateral policy. Um, and uh, we have a lot of diplomats in New York who will be very dedicated to making sure that the United Nations itself is, a, is as efficient as possible, is as fair as possible in making uh, its decisions. And again, we're not afraid to say uh, no to the biggest uh, to the biggest countries when we if we actually believe that they're wrong. Um, maybe I'll 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 stop there, and we could try some other questions. All right. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, before, we, before we move on to the second batch, I would like to remind everyone to please uh, share your moments with us from this event by tagging at FPC Indo and at Canada and in Indonesia on your social media page uh, so we can have a look, yes. Uh, for the second batch, we have Astrid Riza. Uh, please state your name and your question. For, uh, thank you for FCI and Mr. Ambassador. My name is Astrid Samiranti. So lately, I've been doing independent research uh, about drug cartels. So uh, and I didn't see how Canada facing or special especially way to handle the drug cartels in their country. So maybe you can show us uh, how Canadian how Canada uh, handle it, the drug cartel, especially for this pen, uh, for this pandemic era. I think uh, drug cartels using this era to maybe uh, to uh, to giving the drugs for all, all around country, especially Indonesia. Actually, because I I've been uh, read write about the news about uh, how drug cartels uh, giving the the drug for Indonesian in this pandemic era easily. So I think that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're accepting more questions. Please use the raise hand feature. All right, we have Nabila Wolfa Madani. So I have Nabila. Uh, thank you for the change. So uh, actually, uh, uh, when we are in uh, the crisis uh, because uh, it's caused of COVID-19, uh, the 
actually the 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 multilateral uh, the bilateral uh, relation between uh, Canada and Indonesia is uh, will face some uh, some difficulties such as the uh, 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 when we uh, when we are talking about uh, the uh, how the how the market uh, go uh, how the market uh, goes in the uh, in our uh, relations actually uh, every country uh, should be uh, using their uh, their their support for uh, protect the uh, protect protect the uh, the national and uh, the nationality industry so that's why uh, both of uh, Indonesia and uh, and even if uh, Canada uh, would like to protect their market uh, and uh, uh, would you tell us how uh, how actually uh, how how should uh, Indonesia and Canada uh, uh, would uh, respond to this uh, problem? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions for batch two? If not, we'll uh, give the floor back to Ambassador. Okay, All right. Great. So, ex excellent questions. Um, I think uh, first on drug cartels, um, I will say um, my, my greatest experience with drug cartels was actually my last diplomatic posting. I was the Canadian ambassador to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Honduras. Um, those three countries do not produce cocaine, uh, but they're a major um, transit hub uh, for cocaine going to the North American and the European market. Um, cocaine is produced typically in uh, Colombia, Peru, um, refined there, um, and then trafficked through Central America um, up to uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, so frankly, it was a real top concern for Canada in that region um, because the cocaine on the streets in Toronto and Vancouver um, that sometimes was killing drug addicts and causing gang wars. Um, I mentioned Canada is not a perfect country. We have drug gangs. Um, and where do the drugs come from? They come from uh, South America and they come through Central America. So um, I have some uh, sort of direct personal experience with um, some of the world's nastiest uh, drug cartels. Um, and they uh, can be very violent. And I know that this is the case in Southeast Asia as well. Of course, there's uh, heroin trade, but there's also synthetic drug uh, trade and uh, countries in this region can be both transit points and manufacturing points. Um, and also, we, you know, Indonesia is a destination market for illegal drugs. It's also a transit point for illegal drugs moving through Indonesia onto other countries. And how do we deal with all of this? Well, frankly, it comes back again, I think, to a really simple uh, diplomatic principle I was speaking of earlier, and that's cooperation. Um, and so cooperation between countries does not happen just between diplomats. It needs to also happen between uh, all of the other government agencies uh, that, uh, that need to be involved. And in this case, of course, it's the police. So in the Canadian Embassy, we have a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. That's our national police force, a little bit like, like POLRI or like the FBI, the RCMP, um, is posted here permanently as a liaison officer with POLRI, working very closely with uh, US and Australian and Thai and other police that are here all collaborating and frankly sharing intelligence um, to try to bring down these, uh, these drug cartels or at least um, undermine them and disrupt uh, the trade. Um, any country that tries to do it exclusively by itself, uh, by definition will fail. Um, drug cartels make their money by transiting borders illegally. So it, you are immediately needing to cooperate with neighbors and, uh, and with other countries. And again, some of the drugs that are manufactured in this region do end up on the streets in Canada. So it, it matters to us to have this kind of cooperation. Um, Canada works, for example, the RCMP are some of the trainers at uh, uh, the Joint Center for, um, uh, for Policing uh, in Samarang and through the police college in Indonesia. So we train together, we share information together, we take diplomatic initiatives together. 
Um, it's only together we can deal with, uh, with drug cartels. Um, and then just briefly on markets and protectionism. And I mentioned in my opening remarks that when the COVID pandemic first hit, many countries had that instinctive reaction to forget about their neighbors, think only about themselves, to close the borders. Of course, we need to close the borders for people and transmission of the virus, but some close the borders for export of uh, drugs. Uh, I mean, to say, you know, needed uh, pharmaceuticals uh, for medical products, for personal protective equipment. Uh, some took protectionist measures for food. Um, this is all, all of that is from Canada's point of view, a terrible mistake and absolutely the wrong policy. Um, if every country decides that they should be entirely self-sufficient in all of the things that matter from medical supplies to food, we can choose that option. I'm aware of one country in the world that effectively has chosen that option. It's an autarky. It's called North Korea. And the standard of living for the average North Korean is commensurately terrible. Um, because they've decided that they need to produce everything themselves. It's a recipe for disaster. Another extreme, uh, one of the world's greatest free markets. There's no tariffs, there's open trade. They have um, strong, clear, stable, predictable rules. Um, almost no corruption. Trade continues to flow freely. Singapore one of the wealthiest uh, countries. Um, uh, and uh, again, for all of the problems and challenges Singapore faces, there's no question that it's prosperous. So um, which direction do we wanna go in as policymakers? Do we wanna go in the direction of North Korea or do we wanna go in the direction of Singapore? And Canada would choose Singapore, of course. So um, it, it is true and it, it's rational to have um, maybe certain critical supplies stored um, for the next pandemic uh, or the next crisis, whatever it may be. But what's more important is to have better rules and more enforceable rules to ensure that trade can continue to flow through a crisis. And this is exactly what Canada and Indonesia worked so hard on through the, um, the ministerial consultative group on COVID-19 is to keep supply chains uh, flowing. It's fine to build your own ventilators as well, but if you stop exporting all the parts that your neighbor needs to make ventilators, you're simply impoverishing your neighbor um, and they will retaliate by not exporting to you something that you need. It's a recipe for poverty. All right. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, for the third batch, I think we have another question from Nabila Ulfamadani. Is that correct? Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for the change. Uh, so uh, if uh, we see the, actually, uh, okay, we admit that uh, 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 we, we couldn't deny that every country will uh, will use the protection, protectionism, but uh, uh, will will this uh, condition will affect uh, uh, the, the uh, the relation between uh, Canada and Indonesia, uh, as we know that uh, Indonesia is uh, 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 has a lot, uh, a big, a very big market for uh, uh, for uh, to keep uh, this uh, this uh, market process to grow. So, so that's why uh, I think uh, some uh, some big, uh, there are a lot of uh, big country that uh, giving uh, giving the giving Indonesia. Uh, Pressure to, uh, to to open up the market, uh, but uh, in in other side uh, we uh, Indonesia of course uh, should use protectionism uh, also. So uh, uh, when we are in a pandemic uh, situation, uh, this uh, like uh, free trade agreement, uh, of course uh, it will uh, we should uh, we should we should use a lower standard for uh, the the connection between uh, bilateral or even a multilateral uh, relation be be between one and another, another country uh, because uh, uh, we we are together uh, uh, should uh, face this uh, situation so uh, so uh, so that's why uh, because uh, all of us uh, should survive of course then uh, 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 what we want is uh, this 
uh, the situation will not affect uh, the the relation between the between the countries uh, very much. Uh, then, uh, what what do you think that uh, will will it uh, will this uh, condition uh, will, uh, give the the big impact between uh, uh, the market that uh, have uh, Indonesia Indonesia and Canada Canada uh, Canada already met? Thank you. All right, Ambassador, I think uh, you can directly respond to that. Sure. Yeah. So that's a great follow on question from before about kind of in the post COVID world, free trade versus protectionism. And um, I think it's important here maybe to look back at, at history a little bit. If you look at the 1920s, uh, when we had a roaring global economy uh, through most of the, uh, the 20s and, and in Canada and Europe and the United States, we actually called that decade the roaring 20s, because there was so much wealth and prosperity. And then at the end of that decade in 1929, there was the stock market crash in New York. The economy started to slow down in the United States. The US Congress decided the best economic strategy is protectionism. We should now protect ourselves from these cheap goods that are coming in from Europe or Canada or anywhere else. We need to close our borders and manufacture everything ourselves. Of course, when the United States did that, the United Kingdom uh, responded and said, well, America, if you're not going to trade with us, we will not trade with you. Canada made the same decision, France, everyone closed their borders. And in English, we call those beggar thy neighbor policies. That means a policy to make your neighbor poor. And the problem is that if you have that policy, your neighbors will have the same policy, everybody uh, tends to retaliate and do the same thing. And that's how the 1920s became the 1930s. Uh, again, globally, mostly in the West, but globally, and we had the Great Depression. Tremendous poverty and suffering uh, for a decade because people did not understand uh, the logic of allowing trade and markets to be open and to be free. Um, but after the Second World War, realizing those mistakes, and by the way, the 1930s, of course, were, uh, and the depression, the Great Depression of the 1930s was one of the major factors that led Germany to become impoverished and decided that it needed to be strong again and triggered the Second World War. So it was after the Second World War, policymakers got together and said, we can't allow this to happen again. We must create the United Nations. We must create the International Monetary Fund to make sure that money flows internationally when it needs to. The World Bank so that we have a national bank that can help governments to rebuild um, economies that were destroyed by trade. And we need um, what became the general agreement on tariffs and trade, now the World Trade Organization, to have robust and forcible rules to ensure that trade would continue to flow through a crisis. And indeed, I think Canada and Indonesia have been dedicated to that. As I mentioned earlier, in the COVID-19 crisis, we have to have trade continue to flow. If we respond with protectionism, um, it may work for a few months or for a year, uh, but eventually um, you become North Korea uh, because you're not trading with anyone and you decide to make everything yourself. So there's one, I want to give you the example of one other country in the region um, that has really uh, you know, faced this decision to make about protectionism versus free trade, Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is you know, arguably not a democratic country. It, it has um, uh, all of its own uh, challenges, but the one um, commitment that it has made is it has joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It has opened its economy. It has uh, negotiated very robust provisions on, um, in a treaty uh, to protect and keep open trade and investment. Um, and as a result, when the United States and China uh, had their trade war over the last couple of years and American companies and other international companies were looking at relocating away from China. Uh, the great majority of them, uh, and the World Bank did a study on this last fall, the great majority of them went to Vietnam because Vietnam is not protectionist. So if you wanna build a strong economy, if you wanna build a globally competitive economy, if you want your citizens to prosper, if you want to attract foreign investment, you want to have the world's best technology, the world's most competitive 
uh, companies, if you want the highest standard of living for your taxpayers and your consumers, protectionism is the wrong choice. All right, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Now we have another question from Fadil Pramadiansyah. The floor is yours. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, I would like to ask about the uh, Trans-Pacific Trans -Pacific Partnership. Uh, as we know that Canada is still in there. And, um, yeah, we know that as United States uh, withdrawal from the TPP, um, there's a loophole that um, uh, United, which the United States uh, has it um, accounted for 62% of its GDP. So, uh, what is the uh, what is the uh, Canada? Um, what what are what is your what is Canada uh, effort to uh, maintain this TPP? Or maybe uh, you have some uh, news from for us that what is Canada doing right now? Uh, amidst this pandemic. Thank you. So um, on the TPP, actually maybe first I should say this just as a little bit of background. So Canada has always been a member of the global agreement on or the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Um, we were a founding member of the World Trade Organization. We've always been um, you know, a very trade dependent economy, um, particularly with the United States, but we also trade with uh, almost every other country in the world. Um, and, uh, but it was in the 1980s when we really made the sorts of decisions that Vietnam is making now that we decided um, to bet on free trade rather than protectionism. Before the 1980s, Canada had a relatively protected economy, uh, a lot of state-owned enterprises, um, and, uh, and high tariffs. Um, and we uh, spent several years in the 1980s negotiating a free trade agreement with the United States of America. It was the world's first FTA. Um, it was a terribly controversial um, agreement. We had a national election over it. It was basically the, the top question in a Canadian national election. I myself was a university student at the time. I was adamantly opposed to free trade with the United States. I was convinced that if we had free trade with the United States, the Americans would take all of our water, they would destroy our public health care system that I told you about, destroy the public education system that I told you about, they would force everyone, all the schools and the hospitals to be privatized, they would buy all the Canadian companies, um, and we would all be just branch plant workers in an American dominated uh, economy. Um, and I was wrong. I was really, I, I frankly was completely wrong. Um, instead, there was some painful adjustment to the Canadian economy. There were indeed some businesses that were not competitive that went out of business, but there were many more businesses that were able to compete and suddenly had a much larger market instead of a relatively small Canadian market. Now they had an enormous North American market that became very successful uh, and created many more jobs. Then we expanded the Canada-US free trade agreement to the North American free trade agreement and brought Mexico into the deal. Uh, so we had a North American economic powerhouse. Since then, Canada has negotiated free trade agreements with the European Union uh, and uh, much of Latin America. We have free trade agreements in the Middle East. We have free trade agreements in Asia with, uh, with Korea, for example. Um, and finally, our last sort of really big trade agreement was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And ironically, it was the United States under the Obama administration that kind of really picked up and pushed the TPP uh, forward, took, took over the flame from New Zealand and Chile and others who had started it, and very deliberately brought in Japan, Canada, Vietnam, uh, and of course, Australia, New Zealand, and others. And then President Trump, of course, decided that the U.S. would not become part of the TPP. They withdrew. So the remaining TPP members, the 11 of us, decided to push ahead anyway. Frankly, we think this was a terrible mistake on the part of the president. Um, and we, uh, we've pushed ahead with the Trans-Pacific Partnership anyway. It does not include the United States, although Canada already has a trade agreement with the United States and many of the other uh, TPP members also do. I mean, Australia does, uh, for example. Um, and the TPP is working. Um, it's making Canada more prosperous. Can Canadian trade with Vietnam is increasing. Canadians have more economic opportunity now and Vietnamese have more economic opportunity now. And now Canada has free trade with Japan, Australia, New Zealand, 
um, Vietnam, Brunei, and, and the others. Um, so um, the TPP has been a real success uh, for us. Um, and I mentioned earlier sort of about thinking like a Canadian about diversity and tolerance and multilateralism, frankly, and there's a debate about free trade in Canada, certainly not everyone agrees, but the great majority of Canadians think that more trade and better trade will make all of us uh, wealthier. Um, and so that's the, that's the perspective through which we frankly would like to have a free trade agreement with Indonesia. Not because we want to somehow come in and as a developed country do dominate in some way, there's far more Indonesians than there are Canadians. But if we reduce the barriers between us and allow our businesses to cooperate more than they do now, and we set out very clear rules that will last for the next 10 and 20 years in a treaty, um, all of our experience shows, all the data shows that um, Canada and Indonesia would both be better off. The feasibility study that we did, for example, um, uh, showed that the Indonesian uh, GDP gross domestic product would increase by $7 billion if uh, Indonesia had a free trade, had freer trade with Canada. Um, and the Canadian economy would also grow. All right, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now for the next batch of questions, uh, I do would like to remind that Lecturers, uh, Dosen, are also welcome to ask questions. So, okay, I see here we have a question from Noto of FPCI. Uh, so please, Noto. Oh, hello, Ambassador. So thank you, thank you for giving your time. Um, you know, uh, I'm curious on one issue that I think also very important for uh, the students to know about this. Um, we know that the G7 uh, which is kind of the one of it, uh, the informal block of industrial uh, democracies and advanced economies. Uh, what's your view on the recent development when we see that U.S. just pull out troops from Germany, uh, a third of the U.S. troops in Germany, and then, you know, the, the problems with uh, France and Germany relation with the EU, which is also their part of the G7 countries. So what's your view on Canada's positions in seeing relevancy of the G7 countries um, at the, at the post-pandemic era. Uh, do you see just relevant? Meanwhile, we can also see that other multilateral, multilateral institutions like the UN uh, deem to have some significant difficulties in dealing with the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I just want to know what's your view on the Canada's, Canadians' positions uh, on the relevancy of G7 uh, on the pot, at the post-pandemic era. Right. Let, let me say about that, that um, again, you know, if you, if you think like a Canadian uh, and you, you, you know, you want this uh, diversity and pluralism, but also, you know, multilateralism and cooperation and coordination internationally, the truth is the Canadian instinct almost always is to think that if there's a group or a club where countries get together and talk frankly about important issues and either make decisions about them uh, or at least have a good solid debate and discussion and understand them in a more deep way and have a dialogue, all of those uh, fora are useful. So, um, you know, the biggest ones where almost everyone is a member of the United Nations, um, of course, has its role um, and a very important one. Um, because of its, you know, near universality. Um, and then, you know, the G20, 20 largest economies in the world. Um, the Commonwealth is another uh, organization that Canada is a member of English speaking countries, former colonies of the United Kingdom, um, where we all uh, find that that can be a useful form and the Francophonie, um, French speaking countries around the world, a member of that, and, and many other organizations. So, it's, it's in that context, I think, that we have to analyze the G7. Um, the G7, which briefly was the G8, because Russia was going in the direction of being a democratic, what was arguably a, de a democratic country for some years, and then stepped back from that, uh, including with the invasion of Crimea, et cetera. So uh, that's why we got back to the, to the G7. It's not a perfect institution, but is it a useful forum for discussion? Um, it certainly can be. Uh, Canada last hosted in 2018. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, hosted that G7 summit. Uh, President Trump came. 
uh, and the other you know, G7 leaders of the day. Um, I was actually part of the summit team and was able to um, uh, listen in on all of the discussions that they had. Really good, useful, deep discussions between this small group of world leaders where they literally sit at a round table, just seven of them talking to one another. And frankly, that is something that even the G20 just cannot replicate. If you've ever tried to have a conversation over lunch or dinner with 20 people, it, it very quickly turns into people talking to one another, their immediate neighbors, and you're not having a single conversation. But you have a group of just seven, or it could be a little larger, it could be 10. I mean, this, you know, it, there's been some speculation recently about having a D10, uh, you know, 10 you know, major democratic countries. Um, but groups of that size are very useful, even if they're not making decisions or making international law or voting on anything. Um, that's really more the ambit of the UN and the WTO, but just the dialogue at that level, I think can be useful. Um, and at the G7, almost always on the second day, we have invitees where others come and have a thematic discussion. So uh, at the Canadian summit in Charlevoix, um, we had follow-on discussions in particular on the theme of oceans uh, where we launched the Oceans Charter and Canada has been very committed um, uh, and works very closely with Indonesia on issues of oceans and climate change, women and girls education. These were all sort of top uh, themes for us when we hosted. Of course, it depends on who the host is and what their own priorities are. Post COVID, there certainly are tensions as there always are between G7 countries and maybe those are greater now than ever. But I think it would be a mistake to say that the G7 is, you know, now useless and we, sh uh, at least until we have something very similar to it uh, on the same scale to replace it. I think as well, you know, to the extent there are disagreements, of course, between democratic countries, that's always going to be the case, but democracies have something very special in common with one another. And I think it's important to have a forum where democratically elected leaders who were chosen by the people they represent um, get together and speak to other democratically elected leaders. Um, and we may agree or disagree but, uh, about various other policies, but at least we agree on the fundamentals of what government should be, um, which is in theory, at least bottom up and not top down. Great, thank you. And now we have another question from Bima Perwira. Please state your name and your question. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, and good afternoon, Ambassador. My name is Bima. I would like to ask about a bilateral cooperation between Indonesia and Canada in this pandemic crisis. Maybe this is a bit related to the previous questionnaire. As we are all know that Indonesia and Canada has comprehensive corporations such as investment and product marketing, um, such as a cocoa, coffee, cereals, peppers, vehicles, and others. Even in 2019, Canada became the 14th, ledger, 14th large, largest investor in Indonesia. So I would like to specify what happened to these products and this investment in this crisis. I mean, has the sale of these products has been restricted or even banned during this pan uh, pandemic? Thank you. So we, we have um, several uh, means by which there's Canada-Indonesia um, cooperation, including um, you know, development assistance that goes back to the 1950s when, uh, you know, when Canada started um, sort of having more intense um, cooperation projects with, uh, with Indonesia. Um, and then with respect to these particular commodities, we do invest now about $15 million a year through the embassy. Um, in uh, so-called cooperation assistance. This isn't just one way, by the way, it's very much like a, a dialogue between us about what is it that we um, might know and what does Indonesia know that we can learn from each other. Um, and just on the issue of cooperatives, like agricultural cooperatives, Canada does indeed have decades of experience with agricultural cooperatives. It's we don't have coffee or um, tropical fruit or palm oil, but we do have um, wheat and pulses uh, and you know we're a major agricultural exporter ourselves. My own ancestors farmed on a farm in Saskatchewan and were members of a cooperative um, and that was a matter of all of the farmers getting together and investing together 
in a place to store their grain and then investing together and finding means to ship uh, their grain out of the community. This is, you know, for wheat. Um, Canada, by the way, is still a very major uh, uh, producer of wheat um, and, uh, and grains and an exporter to Indonesia. Indonesia is an enormous market for Canadian wheat, which goes into your Indomie noodles. Um, and uh, the origins of that export came from Canadian cooperatives. And now we're a very significant buyer, as you said, of um, Indonesian produced co-op products, including um, coffee. That trade has continued through the COVID pandemic. Canada has not increased any tariffs, trade barriers. Um, you, you heard me speak before about protectionism. The Canadian government really didn't institute uh, protectionist policies in response to, um, and certainly not with respect to foods or imports from places like Indonesia. The truth is that we, we see imports from that free trade perspective. Imports of goods from Indonesia into Canada are a good thing. We should have more of them. Uh, more Indonesian coffee, we want more Indonesian tourists, more students, etc. But Indonesian goods um, that frankly can be inputs to then Canadian production. Um, and that should go both ways. Again, it's Canadian wheat that goes into Indonesian Indomie noodles. It's Canadian fertilizer, um, uh, potash uh, that is exported in uh, very large quantities to Indonesia and, and uh, helps Indonesian farmers and agricultural producers from palm oil to everything else grow their own products. Um, so we need your products and you need ours and there have been no significant restrictions uh, post COVID, which is the way it, it should be. All right, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm giving out the floor for any more questions, if there are any more uh, questions. If not, then I think we can cut it there uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, we, we have an Instagram quiz, do we? Is that next? Right. All right, uh, so anyways, thank you Ambassador McKay and thank you to all the students for your questions. And before we close, I mentioned, as I mentioned before, the Canadian Embassy has prepared a fun quiz for us. So Bapak Fajar of the Embassy will be leading the quiz. So Bapak Fajar, the floor is yours. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. All right, okay. So uh, has everybody followed uh, our Instagram account? Yeah, okay. Now, um, I'm, I have um, five packages of environmentally friendly uh, souvenirs specially produced by the Embassy of Canada. So um, I'm going to ask you five questions whose answers you can find on our Instagram page at Canada in Indonesia. So um, uh, Cindy will uh, help me with uh, picking the uh, 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 the people who will answer the questions, okay? So, <clears throat> are you guys ready? To answer yes. your questions, please use the raise hand feature. All right. okay. yes. Good. Uh, all right. So, the first question is, on which island in Indonesia has Canadian Gilles Raymond work and made contributions to the local communities for 20 years. Which Indonesian island? If you know the answer, please raise your hand. <laughs> it's on our Instagram. Anybody? You should go stalk 
Uh, you can check the Instagram. Instagram. Yes, <laughs> at Canada in Indonesia to find yeah. out the answer. Yes. You can open at Canada in Indonesia. Once you find the answer, please mm -hmm. raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. Is anybody know the answer? Mm -hmm. Which Indonesian island? Just take a guess. Yes. Okay, I'll 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 give you four choices. Whoever uh, pick it the uh, um, the correct answer uh, first will get the package from us. So. The choices are A, Sulawesi, B, Bali, C, Flores, or D, Papua. Sulawesi, Bali, Flores, or Papua. Bima Perwira has raised his hand. Okay. Um, I will take a guess. Yes, and... which island? Flores, I guess. Flores, are you sure? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you uh, check the, our Instagram, or just uh, take? Uh, did you take a wild guess? Just a wild guess. Okay. Well, you are correct. Congratulations. So, uh, Canadian Jill Raymond has. Um, uh, worked and contributed to the local communities to, uh, in Flores for 20 years now. Uh, he is the um, subject of an uh, award-winning documentary called The Water Bearer. So congratulations, Pima. So, um, okay, let's go to the next question. How many of you um, have a desire to study in Canada? Raise your hand, yeah. Anybody? Okay, great. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Dalhousie University is known for its ocean science research. In which city in Canada is Dalhousie University? It's on our Instagram. You can open it. This is an easy one. Yes. It's right at the front page. <laughs> I'm not going to give you multiple answers now because it's very easy. Maybe check out the picture <laughs> with the blue sky and the building. Uh, we have Fadil Pramadiansha. Oh. Okay. Fadil, what's your answer? It's in Halifax, Nova Scotia. In Halifax? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Pretty yes, sure. okay. Dalhousie University is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Congratulations. Okay. Now we move on to the third questions. Okay. Um, name the activist whose interview we featured on World Environment Day. So you have to know which day is the World Environment Day. It was just recently. Yeah. Asia, Monica. Um, Asia, what's your answer? June five. Yes. What What's the um, the name of the activist? Um. I'm sorry, I don't know. No. Okay. Let's. Give another chance to... We have Farah Zahira, okay. who raised her hand first. Another student, yes. Uh, Farah, what's your the answer? The name of the 
Indonesia is Tisa Mafira. Tisa Mafira, are you sure? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Congratulations. So, uh, we interviewed Tisa Mafira from Diet Kantong Plastic for World Environment Day this year. So, um, we work with uh, Diet Kantong Plastic to uh, support the first uh, plastic. Uh, bag free market in Jakarta. Just for your information, in Jakarta, starting July 1st this year, um, there will not be plastic bags allowed in traditional, in public market. So, congratulations. So, um, we move on to the fourth question. Um, okay. Who likes uh, Canadian music? Who who listens to Canadian uh, artist? Does Justin Bieber count, Pak Fajar? Yeah, does Justin Bieber, <laughs> Shawn Mendes, they're all Canadian artists. Michael Bublé also. So uh, recently, Canadian artists got together to uh, sing a song to raise donations for the Canadian Red Cross um, for... Um, its response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So who can tell me which songs that this Canadian artist decided to remake for this uh, fundraising activity? So. <laughs> A lot of answers. All right, I think the first one was Ayub Alfaras. Uh, okay, uh, so my answer is uh, Lean on me, the title of the song. Lean on me. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes, congratulations. You okay. just won a package of uh, um, environmentally friendly Canadian souvenirs. And okay, so last question uh, will be very easy, but so um, yeah, so be quick. Okay. Which animal was featured on our Instagram for World Ocean Day? <laughs> Anissa Apriliani. Yes, Anissa, what's your answer? Sorry, yes. Okay. I What's haven't really answer? seen this animal, but um, yeah. it is called that um, a Canada's um, unicorn because it has a tusk. So, mm -hmm. and it is a whale, though. Yeah. What? What? What's the animal called? Um, it is. Um, you can open the Instagram. <laughs> I'm looking at the screen, but I haven't really seen the name. Um, narwhal. Yes, correct. It's called yes. Narwhal. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Cindy, <laughs> for your help. Do we have some uh, closing statements from the ambassador, Pak Fajar? Hi, everyone. I simply want to thank you all for joining us today uh, and for taking the time um, to, uh, to listen to what I had to say. Excellent questions from each of you. Thanks for participating in, uh, in Fajar, Pak Fajar's uh, quiz. And uh, I do hope that someday when it's safe to do so, um, we can actually meet uh, in person uh, and take all of these, uh, these discussions a little bit further. So thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And with that, we have come to the close of our ambassadorial lecture today. Uh, once again, thank you to His Excellency Ambassador Cameron McKay for your time and everybody at the IR Department of Universitas Hasanuddin. We hope to see you in our future events. Good afternoon. Bye all. <laughs>